Hello and uh, welcome to CMC Markets and this Monday market update. My name is Michael Hewson, I'm Chief Market Analyst here and uh, I will be basically taking a quick look at the markets and um, having a look at the week ahead. Before I get started um, with this week's Monday webinar on Monday the 28th of November 2016, I have to bring up the obligatory risk warning. Hopefully you can all hear me loud and clear now. Um, anything that you hear today is, is, is not trading advice, investment advice or anything like that. It's just a, a broad overview of what I'm looking at this week, what I think will drive markets this week, some of the key chart points um, on various various markets and um, it will obviously be culminating with another webinar on Friday, the non-farm payrolls webinar, which again we will be covering live here at CMC Markets. Um, I won't be covering it, unfortunately I will be away on business, but uh, my colleague Colin Szynski will be covering the non US non-farm payrolls numbers, um, potentially along with my colleague Jasper Lawler. Um, this will be the last Monday, last Monday webinar um, for the next couple of weeks. Um, I will be um, there. Will there won't be a webinar next next Monday, um, as both myself and Jasper will be away, um, and we'll be back on the 12th of December. But um, I might as well get started and certainly looking at. Um, US markets and whether or not we're going to continue to see the strong rally that we've seen in US markets, um, bond yields, sell-off in bond markets and uh, the big rise in the US dollar and there does appear to be some indication that potentially the rally in US markets could well be starting to run out a little bit of a, st uh, run out of a little bit of steam as is the current dollar rally. We've seen a bit of a sell-off in the dollar index over the course of the past um, 24 to 48 hours we can sort of see that in this dollar index chart here we have managed to recover most of today's losses um, I think a lot of the losses were based on um, a couple of tweets that uh, Mr. Trump sent out I think there's a perception that maybe given the given the rally that we've seen over the course of the past few days that maybe it's time as we're coming to the end of the month that we could see a little bit of what I would call profit taking on some of those dollar long positions. There's also the fact that I think there's potential that the bond market sell off that we've seen in the past few weeks could actually be starting to find a little bit of a base in the short to medium term. So we're going to be looking at the bond market. It's going to be looking obviously at the OPEC meeting as well. The sell off in the oil price that we've seen in the last 48 to 72 hours and whether or not that can be sustained. Obviously that's predicated on OPEC actually being able to cobble together some form of agreement at the meeting that's due on Wednesday in Vienna. And I'm going to start with that, I think. I'm going to start with, with the oil price because the oil price has been pretty choppy over the course of the past few weeks and months, largely on the basis of that meeting that we um, saw at the end of September in Algiers where oil ministers pledged to come to some form of agreement to cap oil output between 32 and a half and 33 million barrels a day for OPEC members and obviously that was the OPEC meeting that we the announcement at the end of September since then oil prices have drifted a little bit lower um, and drifted sharply lower on the back of that announcement at the end of last week which um, said that Saudi Arabia wouldn't be wouldn't be sending a delegate to this technical meeting on quotas which was due to due to begin today and this technical meeting was with non OPEC members so I mean non OPEC members are really the fly in the ointment here um, OPEC OPEC was looking to cap production at around about 33 million barrels a day as it is production is already in excess of that and Iran wants to boost production to in excess of 4 million barrels a day and then you've got Russia who is who are currently still um, pumping at record levels of in excess 
of 11 million barrels a day and, OP and Russia is not a member of OPEC so you've got to factor that into the equation as well. Ultimately for all the, for all the warm words of a deal the likelihood is now that the tone is starting to change and this marked change of tone um, from the Saudis would appear to suggest that ultimately they can't get an agreement between Iraq and Iran to either cap or cut production from current levels and that that really I think means that potentially we could actually not see an agreement at this OPEC meeting on Wednesday and certainly that's being reflected if we look at what oil prices have done over the course of the past few weeks they've been pretty much capped at around about 52 53 dollars a barrel on Brent that was last week's price movement we were up until Friday morning all the way up here in terms of the gains that we were looking to make and ultimately we only closed at a very marginally higher now today we are still slightly slightly higher but again we we are we are struggling I think that we will struggle to hang on to any sorts of gains in the absence of any sort of deal so for the interim I'm expecting to see this oil price here to continue to trade in the range that it's been in over the course of the past few days and actually while I think there's an awful lot of skepticism that there will be a deal ultimately I think I would never rule out the capacity of OPEC producers to come up with some form of surprise I don't think that we're going to get any sort of meaningful deal but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't squeeze all the way back up to these sort of peaks that we saw uh, at last week around about $50 a barrel. For me $50 a barrel I think is the real key tipping point for me on Brent. If, as long as we stay below last week's highs then ultimately I think the line of least resistance for crude prices is to continue to chop towards the lower end of this recent range. So I'm certainly looking to see a move back towards these November lows around about $43 a barrel and ultimately to head back to the lows that we saw at the end of July and the beginning of August around about 42 certainly the RSR the slow stochastic would appear to suggest that that's where we're probably going to go so for me at the moment I think I think while the dollar remains fairly strong I think the oil price is likely to remain slightly skewed towards the downside because at the moment I can't see any prospect of Saudi Arabia, Iran and Iraq of coming to any sort of agreement that's really going to make a significant dent in the production capacity or the production output. So they could talk about it but ultimately it's, I think the markets are starting to look at it and they're starting to price in quite a bit of pessimism as to whether or not we're going to get a deal on Wednesday. So what does, that, <coughs> what does that bring us to? Well it brings us now neatly on I think to bond markets because I certainly think that we've seen a little bit of weakness early on in terms of the oil price and in terms of equity markets but I think there is some evidence over the course of the past few days that potentially we could be finding a little bit of a base in this current bond market sell-off. Looking at the gilt price at the moment <coughs> let's, um, let's try and drill down into the detail a little bit on that in terms of UK gilts we've we're back above the level that we saw prior to the Brexit referendum of 1.4% um, which obviously is is a net positive for sterling we are starting though to show some sorts of signs that we could potentially be hitting a bit of a uh, bit of resistance around about 124 and a half now if we break through 124 and a half uh, this 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 level here on the gilt price then we could actually start to see yields come back off a little bit so I'm looking at 124.90 125 on UK gilts if we get a rally back through here 125 then we could see yields start to fall back and this is a pattern that does appear to be replicating itself not only in gilt markets but also in US Treasury markets we've seen a massive spike in yields a massive sell-off in prices we've seen US two-year yields hit their highest level since 2010 and that in itself is significant but if we look at the <coughs> if we look at the slow stochastics um, we are looking in very oversold territory 
we do appear to have found a bit of a base on the US 10 year note at around about 125. That's not to say that we can't go any lower, but what I would be looking to see is for a little bit of a rebound in US 10 year note back above 126, and that could in turn push yields back down. In the, on the four hour chart, we are looking a little bit overbought, so that probably does give us a little bit of um, a little, give a little bit of scope for a little bit of sideways trading. But ultimately, we do appear, I think we, there is a chance we could have seen a little bit of a short term top in US yields for the time being. Now, why do I say that? Well, one of the reasons I think is obviously we've got a whole host of US economic data out for later this week which culminates or book in which is bookended by non-farm payrolls on Friday we've also got the latest Q3 GDP US revision for its third quarter and that's likely to be a fairly decent number some of the Q4 numbers have been fairly positive and ultimately I think market expectations for rate rises from the US for next year are starting to get slightly ahead of themselves yes I think that we will see a rate rise in December it's 100% priced in by the market so I think it's going to be very unlikely that the Fed are going to sort of pull back from raising rates in December which then basically brings us on to the next conversation that which markets need to have and it's how many rate rises are we going to get in 2017 now we had a similar sort of conversation a year ago with respect to the Fed raising rates and markets were pricing in four rate rises for 2016. Here we are almost 12 months later and we're still waiting for the first one. So I think it's unwise for markets to get overly ahead of themselves when it comes for US rate rise expectations. Nonetheless, the, the rally that we've seen in the dollar thus far over the past few weeks does appear to suggest that we will probably get a rate rise in the early part of 2017 barring a significant deterioration in the US economic data. And by deterioration, I mean a non-farm payrolls number which comes in less than 100,000 on Friday. So it won't affect, it won't affect the December pay, it won't, won't affect the probability of a December rate rise, but a very weak December payrolls number could well impact future expectations for rate rises going forward. Certainly the retail sales numbers or the durable goods numbers that we've seen out of the US economy over the past couple of months would appear to suggest that consumer sentiment is starting to pick up, spending is starting to pick up, we've got personal spending data also coming out later this week so ultimately I think um, it's now all about expectations for rate rises after the December one and less about um, how <coughs> less, less about how many, less about when we're going to get a next rate rise and more about how many we're going to get going forward into 2017. So if I look at if I look at the uh, if I look at the 10 year note on the US Treasury, I think there I think there is some scope for a little bit of a consolidation at these low levels. If we look at it on the weekly chart, we can see that from how far we've come in the past two to three weeks we've seen a really sharp sell-off and I certainly think that's warranted in terms of the reflation expectations but ultimately I think now is the time for a little bit of caution because I think the move that we've seen thus far probably is not warranted on the basis of what President Trump may deliver or President-elect Trump may deliver there's still an awful lot of what I would call um, water to flow under that bridge before Mr. Trump is inaugurated in January. At the moment we've got promises of a fiscal stimulus. Now, now I think what we want to see is the reality of it and I think we're going to have to wait a while for that to unfold. But certainly I think the sell-off in the bond markets that we've seen over the course of the past few weeks is due for a little bit of a consolidation. I still think there's potential for it to go further but in the short term I think we're due a little bit of a rebound. And I think in that context that could actually see a little bit of a top a short-term top in the dollar. That's no better borne out in the sell-off that we've seen in the cable today, um, but also the sell-off that we've seen in dollar-yen. And I think it's the, I think it's the yen that I think we've really got to keep an eye out for, for clues as to the long-term direction of um, the US dollar. Because I think if I look at the dollar-yen, um, that's giving me some very good indications that we may have seen a little bit 
of a short term top in the dollar what I would hope to see in this particular chart here and at the moment we've we've peaked just below 114 I think what we what I'm looking for now is this is very overbought this particular oscillator but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't continue to go higher but what I don't want to see on this particular chart is if I look at if I look at today's highs which is around 113 we really need to stay below 113 in the short to medium term but also what I'm looking for is I think a break below these consolidation lows through here in the short to medium term so I think in the interim I'm looking for a little bit of a pullback on dollar yen to around about the, the 113 level and I don't know what I've done there I'm just gonna zoom just reset that there we go and looking for a break below 111.35 on the downside to signal this top this is a top and we could well go lower so we'll be keeping an eye on 111.35 dollar yen on the downside and keeping an eye on 113 on the top side for a potential move lower what's also quite interesting in the dollar yen chart is if we look at it on a much longer term basis if we look at it on a monthly chart we can see that 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 move there is fairly bullish and we could certainly potentially go back to 115.60 but from the down move that we've seen from the peaks of 125.85 there is potential for us to go a little bit higher but ultimately I think the potential is limited towards the 61.8% Fibonacci retracement level of the move that we've seen thus far and at the moment we haven't as yet closed above the 50% level so that could actually give us scope for a little move on the month end what I find particularly interesting though is what the yen crosses are doing particularly sterling yen because sterling yen we've seen a really nice rebound on sterling yen it does look a little bit overextended and certainly if we look at the sterling yen chart there is certainly potential for a significant reversal here on the dailies however this is where looking at the long-term picture can give you an overall view as to where or not sterling yen can go to next and when we look at the long-term chart it gives us a completely different picture and it does appear to suggest that while we could drift lower over the course of the next month or so this is a potential reversal on the sterling yen monthly and actually could indicate that maybe sterling on a, on a, sh on a longer term basis has found a short term has, has found a decent base for a bit of a recovery after the declines that we've seen over the course of the past two to three months so what is this telling me well this is telling me on a short term basis we've potentially got room to move lower towards around about 136 and potentially 134 135 so on a short term basis sterling yen probably going to drift back down to around about 138 and 136 but I think potentially we've seen the lows and we could actually start to correct higher on a longer term basis so short term bearish longer term bullish this is better borne out I think on euro sterling or sterling euro particularly if we look at it on a monthly chart here this is quite a bullish candle we have still got two months to go on the month so Get, need to be very very careful here about the way this is traded but this is a bullish currently this is a bullish engulfing month so what we don't want to see is a sharp sterling euro sell-off in the next couple of days we need to we need to hold on to these gains but certainly if we look at it on the basis of the daily and the weekly charts we do appear to have reversed an awful lot of the bearishness that we've seen since September and that for me I think is, is, is mildly encouraging in terms of the overall rebound that we've seen in sterling euro or euro sterling if we look at it in euro sterling terms it's a, it's a fairly similar picture what we've seen here and I've drawn a little trend line on this chart here from the lows that we saw in July and we've managed to rebound off that trend line there we are now starting to push back up I think the next resistance level is around about 86 we could overshoot slightly to probably the um, 100 day moving average at around about 8640 but overall I'm actually potentially thinking that euros we've, we've seen we've seen 
the high in euro sterling and potentially could start to test lower but this is the key level that I'm targeting to hold on the upside on euro on euro sterling this, this level around about here on 86.40 so keep 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 an eye on keep an eye on that particular level on euro sterling and um, I think potentially look to put a stop loss back above 80, 86 86 40 or there or thereabouts looking at euro dollar the picture doesn't look anywhere near as cut and dried but I certainly think in euro dollar there is potential for us to go quite a bit lower and this is borne out by the monthly chart here this is the trend line from the 2000 lows at 84 and we've broken below it we're right on the cusp of it here and this this I think here is the key level really it's 105.20 on a monthly basis I really want to see where we finish the end of this month by Wednesday as to where or not we can, where we can go to next we've managed to we've managed to spike back above this trend line here and uh, but we haven't been able to actually consolidate through it uh, ideally what I want to see for a stabilization in euro dollar is a move back through 107.30 until we get that then I think the bias remains towards the downside let me just call that back for a minute that's given me a slightly better indication of where we are so still looking to sell euro dollar on rallies I think the key res the key resistance level I think for me is this is this low through here around about 107.10 so 107.30 I think for me is the key line in the sand if we break through 107.30 then I think we could go back all the way back to 109 but while we're below 107.30 then I think the mentality is on euro dollar to sell the rally um, which now sort of brings us back on to gold prices well actually brings me back brings me to gold prices because we've seen a nasty little sell-off on gold prices on the back of the the reflation trade or the Trump trade um, I'm still not minded to be too overly bearish on gold prices at this point in time for me we are still within the range that we've been in since the beginning of the year we still are up on the year and it's significant for me that despite the fact that markets are pricing in two to three rate rises gold has actually managed to hold up as much as it has and I think a large part of that is down to the uncertainty surrounding what's going on in Europe right now but and this is this is a big this is a big caveat here the fact that we've broken below 1205 which was this series of support levels through here does worry me somewhat in terms of the overall uh, bullish gold trade I think unless we can get back through 1205 then we could well start to drift lower towards 1154 which was uh, the, this level here um, that I targeted from all the way back in the middle of last year so while we're below 12.05, I think the bias remains towards the downside for gold prices. We're seeing a bit of a rebound now, but I think that's largely on the back of a slightly, um, slightly weaker dollar. And while the dollar has managed to recoup some of its losses, um, I think I think that this 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 break of 12.05 could be significant, and we could see a little bit of a drift lower in the short to medium term. Brings me on to equity markets because we've seen a significant divergence between US markets and European markets and this is something that I think will continue to be the case uh, until such times as we break a significantly important level on the Eurostox 50 and the German DAX. If we look at the S&P 500 as a case in point we've continued to break records on that we've continued to break records on the Russell 2000 we've continued to break records on the Dow Jones so for me I think momentum is everything here yes this is overbought but ultimately while we're above this series of highs here at 2194 on the S&P then the bias has to remain towards the top side now that we've broken above these previous all-time highs at 21.95 you know, ultimately you have to play the momentum trade the momentum trade is for US markets to continue to push higher and while we do so then ultimately any dips need to be bought ir 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 irrespective 
of what this particular this particular oscillator is telling you. It's the same for the US 30 here, even more so here. We've seen a massive move away from the previous highs uh, that we saw um, all the way back in 2015. We can blow that all the way out, take it all the way back here. 18670, similar sort of story. But if we look at the performance of European markets, it's a totally different picture. This is a chart that I've been consistently warning people of over the course of the past month or so. This 10,800 level on the DAX continues to be a massive barrier for further gains in European markets. And until such times as we take this level out, then ultimately European markets are going to remain very, very difficult to make any progress on. We've tried it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, on nine occasions, and we've failed to break above it. And it's a similar sort of story on the Euro stocks 50 as well. So until such times as you take out this key resistance level on the Euro stocks 50, but also this trend line resistance from the 2015 peaks, which also currently comes in around the 200 week moving average, then European stocks, I can't, I can't see any prospect of any significant upside um, until such times as the political risk, and it is the political risk here, we've got the Italian referendum coming up on Sunday the 4th of December. The likelihood is that Mr. Renzi is probably going to lose it. That means that the Italian banking problems that have been uh, at the forefront of the markets and the way they've been perceiving European markets are likely to continue to weigh on investor risk and the you know people's risk profile when it comes to looking at European markets and European banks in general because ultimately the Italian banks are the canary in the coal mine. Until such times as European regulators, European leaders deal with the problems of the European banking sector, then to my mind, uh, European stock markets remain not uninvestable, but certainly I think you need to be very, very cautious about being piling into them. Valuations, whatever you think of them, they may be very compelling and they certainly may be undervalued to, relative to US markets. But ultimately, and until this l this particular boil is lanced, it's going to be very, very difficult to see any scenario that's going to push European markets above these key resistance levels on the DAX and the Eurostoxx 50. And between now and the 12th of December, we've also got a European Central Bank rate meeting, which is due on the 8th of December. So again, there, we're going to see what Mr Draghi um, what the ECB's views are with respect to the European economy and certainly I think we have seen inflation numbers pick back up in the euro area. If we look at the euro bund we can see that that has experienced a similar sell-off in yields. We are still though in the long-term uptrend that we've been in for the bund market since 2011-2012 and until such times as we're able to take out that trend line then again it's going to be a similar sort of story for bonds and yields there. We've seen a big big sell-off in bonds, we've seen a, a rise in yields but that yield differential between the euro and the US is continuing to widen in the dollar's favour and while it does so it's going to make it very very difficult for the euro dollar to rally with any significant uh, with any significance whatsoever and it's, it's a similar sort of story with respect to bund yields and gilt yields. The differentials there are, are basically closing in sterling's favour because I think it's very unlikely that the Bank of England will be able to cut rates any further than they already have done. The 25 basis point rate cut that they instituted in October has been more or less wiped out by the fact that UK gilt yields are now back at the levels they were before the European referendum. So the yield differentials for being short of sterling are no longer there. Um, and that, for me, is another reason why I think we've potentially seen a short-term base in the pound against the dollar, which brings me back to this cable chart here. I think while we're above 123.30, then I think rather than being a short-term short -term risk to the downside, 
I think the short term risk in cable is more to the top side. People like to be short sterling. It's 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 the consensus trade. That's why I don't like it. I don't like consensus trades for that very reason because they get crowded. Uh, and uh, until such times as we can, we're able to take out this line here, 123.25, then ultimately I still think that it's a dangerous trade. I know, but uh, sterling is a buy on the dips, uh, and uh, you know that that that's that's my that's my that's my view on it. Um, got one other thing to do. We've seen a massive rebound in commodity prices, particularly copper and iron ore. We've seen that here on this copper weekly chart, but we are now starting to run into a very big resistance level on the weekly chart, the 200 week moving average. So certainly going to be keeping an eye on that. Also, if we take it out slightly a little bit further, we can see where the peaks were in 2010, 2011. We've got a nice little trend line through there. But I, it's important not to underestimate the fact that we haven't been able to take out these peaks here. So this level here on copper could limit the upside in terms of mining stocks on the FTSE 100. It's around about 275, that sort of level there. So what I would hope to see is a move through 280 or on the copper price 277.27, which is the value of the 200 week moving average. So $2.80 to be on the safe side. If we can close above $2.80, then we'll probably see further gains. But at the moment, it's finding a little bit of resistance at current levels and I would be I would be very very cautious about being too aggressively long of the commodity play at these sorts of levels because I think an awful lot of the fiscal stimulus trade is already now priced in and now it's really a question of whether or not first and foremost Mr Trump can deliver on it but also whether or not Chinese demand will pick up and we'll get some idea of that with the latest Chinese PMIs that are out later this week. So for me, I think to sum up this week, keep an eye on bond markets. I think there's a potential that we could have ha we, we could have made a very short term base on them. Keep an eye on commodity prices. Again, the, there's there's potential for us to have topped out a little bit there. The dollar is starting to show some signs of potentially topping out. Keep an eye on that dollar index and ultimately keep an eye on the data. US non-farm payrolls on Friday, US ADP on Wednesday. We've got the non-farm payrolls webinar on Friday. We'll be covering that live from 1.15. You can sign up for that on the education section of the CMC Markets website. Um, but ultimately, I think as we come to month end and as we come to the beginning of December, I think an awful lot of people will have either made their money for the year um, and ultimately um, we could see volume start to start to thin out a little bit towards month end as we come into a significant amount of tail risk or political risk for the weekend the Italian referendum I would think it, I would I would I would not advise running anything over the weekend um, we've I've learned from bitter experience that given the current political climate it's very unwise to do that we already we've already seen a couple of very big gaps in the market um, sterling related um, if there is a an awful lot of what I would call uncertainty as a result of the referendum vote at the weekend then we could see an awful lot of volatility in European markets on the Monday and you don't really want to be the wrong side of that otherwise um, if there are any questions um, I'm more than happy to answer them if not I'd like to say thank you very much for attending I'll post this on YouTube um, shortly Otherwise, thanks very much for listening and we'll see you all on, on Friday.